It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Diana Liverman, the Regents Professor of Geography and Development at the University of Arizona. Dr. Liverman's work inhabits the intersection of climate science, geography, and society, and asks such fundamental questions as, who is most vulnerable to climate change? And how can we alleviate poverty while also developing sustainably and limiting climate change? Her geographical emphasis is on Mexico and Arizona, and topical emphasis on how the disadvantaged are affected by climate change, especially the poor and small-scale farmers. She frequently collaborates with natural scientists and brings to these collaborations a strong advocacy for inclusion of the social sciences, the voice of women, and the expertise found in developing countries and indigenous knowledge. Dr. Liverman has directed the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the Institute of the Environment at the University of Arizona, and is currently the director of the School of Geography and Development at the University of Arizona. She was recently appointed to a new Earth Commission to advise international organizations, cities, and businesses on targets for Earth stewardship. So yes, you can call her an Earth Commissioner. Dr. Liverman is the author or editor of eight books and over 100 articles, has supervised more than 70 masters and PhD students, and has been a lead author on large-scale climate assessments by the National Research Council and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She is the recipient of many awards and was part of the team that wrote the IPCC reports that in 2007 earned that group the Nobel Peace Prize. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Diana Liverman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's find a place to put this. So what a wonderful event at this pivotal moment in our response to climate change. And thank you very much for the invitation, though I sort of wish I wasn't following Richard Alley. He's a hard act to follow, the sort of energizer bunny bouncing around up here um, with great enthusiasm for his science. And uh, what will distinguish my talk is Richard talks to rocks and ice, and actually, uh, my introducer, I believe, talks to bison, where well, I talk to people. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly um, from a social science perspective about responding to climate change. And what I want to talk about is how we can respond to climate change in the context of other global imperatives, specifically the goals of eradicating poverty and hunger, to reduce the suffering of millions of people around the world, as well as people who are in trouble in our own neighborhoods. So former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon sort of captures the question that I'm asking us. And he made this challenge at the Paris Climate Conference in 2015. He asked, can we be the first generation to put an end to poverty and are we the last generation that can put an end to climate change? What that means for me is to ask how can we connect the global goals for sustainable development for all with international efforts to limit warming to one or 1.5 or two degrees Celsius? How can we ensure better lives in our own communities and other localities while reducing emissions and adapting to warmer climates? How can we connect international efforts with what we're doing locally? What are the general development goals that we have for countries and people and communities around the world? Well, even though we're very preoccupied with climate change last week and in this conference, for many people and many countries, the priority is to reduce poverty whether for humanitarian reasons, or in fact to increase the number of economic consumers, or to reduce social unrest. Poverty eradication is 
an absolute priority. There are other goals, often linked to giving assistance to other countries for development, and those include improving access to food, drinking water, giving people sanitation, giving people education, and giving people health care. And over the last decade or 20, 30 years, as environmental problems have become more and more evident, the idea of sustainable development came to encompass development that also protects ecosystems that provide important ecosystem services and provide habitat for other species. So someone at lunchtime said to me, am I going to go away from this conference feeling very depressed? And I promised her some optimism. And so I want to tell you about some really great things that have happened over the last 20 to 25 years. 20 years ago, with almost half the world living in extreme poverty, that's under $1.25 a day, and hundreds of millions without access to clean water, sanitation, education, or health care, the United Nations adopted the Millennium Development Goals, or the MDGs for short. There were eight goals, and they sought to improve lives in the developing world between 1990 and 2015. They had ambitious goals, halving poverty and hunger, reducing child and maternal mortality, increasing access to safe drinking water and to sanitation, increasing education and gender equality, and eliminating developing country debt. And many people are not aware of the amazing success in achieving the Millennium Development Goals. And I'm just showing you some of the results here. And I will admit, I'm showing you the most positive ones, and then we'll come back to that. So, the percent of people living in extreme poverty was more than halved over that period. It dropped from 1.9 billion people living in poverty to 836 million. That's from 47% to 14% by 2015. Hunger also declined, with undernourishment dropping from 23% in 1990 to only less than 13% in 2015. Another thing that many people care about is the drop in child mortality. It was cut in half from 100 children per 1,000 born dying to 47, saving 6 million children's lives. 2.6 billion people gained access to improved drinking water and 2.1 billion to sanitation. In 1990, a quarter of the developing world lacked access to safe drinking water. In 2015, that had dropped to 9%. While some goals were not met, almost all indicators that were used to track the MDGs moved in a positive direction. In addition to success on the MDGs, there was another success that's important to the future in terms of climate change and environmental impact. Fertility rates, which are the number of children that each woman has in her reproductive lifetime, have dropped precipitously. There's been a big decline shown on the graph here, but if you go back a little further, you can see even greater declines. In 1960, on average in the world, women had four children. Now, they're only having 2.5, and in many, many countries, including in the developing world, that is starting to fall below two. This decline, which is mostly a result of improvements in the status of women, education, employment, reproductive rights, this decline in fertility is slowing population growth and the associated environmental impacts. And if we maintain women's rights and choices, population growth is going to level off soon after 2050 and will play a much less of a role in concern about the environmental future. So we've had some incredible successes in development in the last 25 years or so, although there are still millions living in misery, which we must not forget. 
but at least one goal under the MDGs, one target under the environmental sustainability target went in completely the wrong direction. And I wonder if you can guess which one it is. It's carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide emissions increased by 60% over that 25 year period, whilst all of the other MDGs were moving towards a more sustainable role. Now, I'm sure you're already starting to think or you know about why you would find that increase in emissions, and it has a lot to do with the number of people who came out of poverty. So some of the growth in emissions is associated with continued population growth, even though it was starting to slow. A lot of that growth in emissions was that we didn't act. That's one of the things we should feel terrible about because we've known for 40 years that we needed to act. But it's also a result of this success in reducing poverty and hunger. Because as incomes increase, people tend to consume more fossil fuels as they get connected to the electric grid, they purchase a vehicle, and in many places, rising incomes are associated with eating more meat and dairy. And this is very evident in China, which is actually plays a major role in all of this success that I'm talking about, where incomes went up 10 times between 1990 and 2010, and greenhouse gas emissions per person tripled to six tons per person over the same period. In 2015, the United Nations established a new set of goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. And they set out to further decrease and eradicate poverty and hunger, increase even further access to clean water. And in fact, in this case, they were absolutes. The SDGs say, let's eradicate poverty, not just halve it. Um, they sought to um, increase access to clean water and energy, education and health whilst also reducing inequalities and fostering sustainable cities and consumption. And the SDGs also explicitly set out to protect the climate and ecosystems on land and underwater. These are incredibly amb ambitious goals, and they are to be met for the most part by 2030. And unlike the MDGs that focused on the developing world, the SDGs apply everywhere on Earth. They're for everyone, everywhere, not just the developing world. And I think in all of our communities, even though we may not have people living in the sort of extreme poverty and starvation, you can look at the SDGs and think of them as targets for any community anywhere in our country um, in terms of sustainable development. Many countries, and I've talked to uh, some uh, people, particularly in the Caribbean, um, where there are small countries with small go less government capacity, they are completely overwhelmed by the challenges of meeting these multiple goals whilst also addressing the risks of climate change. And that's one reason why, at the Paris climate negotiations, the UN called on the scientific community to prepare a report. The main focus was on whether 1.5 degrees would be less dangerous than 2 degrees of warming and whether, in fact, we could get to 1.5, whether it was possible to limit warming to 1.5. But another goal was that this was the first time um, the IPCC report that was requested, the one on 1.5, was the first um, IPCC report since they'd established the Sustainable Development Goals. So we were asked in the 1.5 report not just to look at how to reduce climate risks, but how to do it in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. I was an author for chapter five. It was a small report with just five chapters. And it was our chapter which tried to focus on the links between climate change, climate action, and sustainable development. And we spent 18 months, it was a fast track report, and that's fast for IPCC. We spent 18 months assessing the scientific literature on the connections between climate and sustainable development. We looked at multiple interactions between climate and development. 
First of all, we looked at the literature on how climate change is threatening and undermining development successes, such as those successes with the MDGs or the projects of big um, international development agencies, as well as local communities. We also uh, looked at how development progress may be contributing to increased emissions, um, whether eliminating poverty um, is sort of guaranteed to increase emissions. But we also looked at how development progress might increase vulnerability by putting people in a situation where they're going to be more affected by extreme events such as hurricanes. And then finally, we looked at what was a much smaller literature, and this would be a call for research because we really, really needed more research to look at this. But what we looked at was how the responses to climate change, how reducing emissions or putting in adaptation projects, how they had synergies and trade-offs with sustainable development. Because we wanted to help countries and communities figure out how to get a triple win, where you could do stuff that both helped you meet the SDGs and help you reduce emissions and help you with climate adaptation, if possible, especially when you had limited resources. So we were looking for what can we learn about low emission pathways out of poverty? Can we get people out of poverty without increasing greenhouse gas emissions? Can we have a food system that reduces emissions, adapts to warming, and improves livelihoods? Would, for example, a response to climate change that involves biofuels, we talked about that in the first discussion, threaten food security or ecosystems? But before we talk about um, what we found in Chapter 5, I'm briefly going to summarize the messages of the 1.5 report, although they were very um, well summarized by Greta Thunberg at the UN yesterday. So it's hard to summarize 400 pages, but here we go. The first message was climate changes here. Climate's already warmed one degree from pre-industrial. And if you only look at the Paris commitments, we're heading for temperatures above 3.5. And we also talked about, we all focus on the 1.5 warming, but that's global. 1.5 global warming is actually much more warming near the poles or over land and at night. Uh, so, for example, in the southwest US, we've already had 1.5 uh, C of warming. We, secondly, we concluded that every bit of warming matters. Negative impacts increase significantly if you have a 2 degree warmer world compared to 1.5. And the example that most people have talked about that we discussed is that at one and a half degrees C um, or at two degrees C, tropical corals disappear. If we can limit warming to 1.5, um, we will, some of them will survive. So there's big differences in ecosystem impacts at 1.5 and 2. And I think you can probably see that in the historical record that Richard was looking at. If you go from 1.5 to 2, you'll double the number of people exposed to water and to heat stress. And also, poverty increases much more at 2 than at 1.5. The message that's had the greatest impact from our report, and I'll be happy to discuss that um, in the panel, was the one where we said we have to act soon, we have to act yesterday, and we have to make very deep cuts in emissions. The thing that people heard was that limiting warming to one and a half degrees C requires a 50% cut in emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Just as an aside, I've had a lot of people, um, including the media, ask me whether the 2030 date is the apocalypse. And I said, no, that is not what we said. In fact, 2030 was sort of an arbitrary point that we picked. Our most important message was that we need to be net zero by 2050, that we need to have emissions taken out of the atmosphere at the same rate we're putting them in. And that will require very, very steep cuts, not the elimination of fossil fuels, but very, very steep cuts. The 2030 date 
was picked actually because of the SDGs, because they're supposed to be uh, met by 2030. And it was also just a convenient year to sort of provide a shorter term target on the way to 2050. So the world will not end in 2030. Um, and the um, differences between 1.5 and 2, they're serious, but they're not apocalyptic. And then the final point we made is that development would be undermined, even at 1.5, but more seriously at 2. In fact, it's already being undermined at one degree of warming. But we did conclude, and this is where I will try to be optimistic again, that triple wins are possible. It is possible to cut emissions, adapt to warming, and achieve the SDGs, but we'll have to try really, really hard. So let's have a look at this fourth conclusion in more detail. And this, I'm just going to talk a bit about what we found in Chapter 5 about links between climate and sustainable development. So the first question we asked is, how is climate change undermining sustainable development? And I've just listed four examples of many here. We already know that climate change and climate extremes are undermining food production, and they're creating food insecurity in different parts of the world. And because we live in a globalized food system where price signals sort of zoom around the world, except to the most remote subsistence communities, a drought or a hurricane in one place affects, can affect food prices and food security for people all around the world. We get these wave effects if you have a big drop in agricultural production in one region. And that means that this goal of eliminating hunger under the SDGs is seriously threatened by climate change. Increasing disaster risks, um, although there's some debate about the role of global warming in hurricanes, I think people think that they're like that the intensity is increasing, if not the frequency. But we also have prolonged and severe droughts in many parts of the world. And those disaster risks can really create uh, terrible economic problems. Uh, so if we take the case of Mozambique, I mean, we've had several hurricanes since then, but Hurricane Idai, Mozambique was one of the countries that have made tremendous progress on development in improving um, on the Millennium Development Goals. And it's back where it started following one major hurricane, which devastated agriculture, cities, and infrastructure. And the background to this slide is what's happened in part of the Bahamas just in the last month. And again, um, the um, political leaders have talked about how this has undermined much of their efforts in development. Climate change is increasing health risks. That makes it harder to meet the health development goals. One of the MGGs was reduce the incidence of malaria. And we know with climate change, we're getting changes in the distribution of mosquitoes that may lead to increases in malaria. And then finally, in terms of the SDGs, the goals of protecting ecosystems, there are so many examples of how climate change is already affecting ecosystems, loss of bird populations, for example, the loss of the corals, and that, of course, makes it much more difficult to achieve the ecosystem SDGs. Um, just last week, uh, in terms of food security and the SDGs, we had a workshop on uh, what's happening in Central America. And there, it is a complex argument, but there has been prolonged drought in the dry corridor. The length of the midsummer drought is increasing. And in much of Central America and Mexico, um, it's not just food security being undermined, it's livelihoods. And it is playing a role in people's decisions to migrate. So let's flip it. I ta just talked about how climate change is undermining development. Well, how might development make climate change worse? Well, I've already referred several times to the idea that reducing poverty can mean higher emissions. Rising incomes are associated in almost all cases with greater consumption of energy, and if the only cheap energy or available energy is fossil fuels, 
that will result in increases in emissions. Rising incomes are also associated with increased demand for water. And in some cases, the photo is of Shanghai, where much of the development, as China's incomes rise, has been right in the coastal zone, which means that more and more people are going to be exposed to severe storms. So you can also see ways in which development, increased wealth, increased choice about where you live can increase vulnerability. And China is an amazing case of rising incomes, bringing people out of poverty. And when people and some of our politicians say, well, the US shouldn't do anything because you know, China's not doing anything, they forget the incredible um, uh, victory or success that China has had in bringing millions of its people out of poverty and feeding them much better. And they still have only one third of the um, emissions per capita of the US. In the IPCC report, we looked at a range of strategies for limiting warming to 1.5 by reducing emissions and for adapting to warming already underway. And these are some of the options that we evaluated in the 1.5 report. And we looked at their technical feasibility, their economic feasibility, their physical feasibility, were they going to work? But we also looked at what they meant for the development issues, for sustainable development. So for each of these, we said, OK, if we use strategy X for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, how might that either have a synergy or a trade-off with sustainable development. We looked at efforts to take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, either through land use changes or through uh, emerging technologies. We looked at geoengineering, which David Keith will talk about. And we looked at all these adaptation projects. Most people assume that adaptation is good for and synergistic with sustainable development, but we wanted to make sure that was true. And just to give you a few examples of what we concluded, um, this is actually from my home state of Arizona. So limiting warming to 1.5 means steep declines in the use of coal, and in fact, policies already in place, for example, in California, are moving the Western US away from coal as a fuel source. But the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona um, is a place heavily dependent on coal. They have coal mines that are important to the economy and to jobs, and they have the Navajo Generating Station and the Four Corners Generating Station they're two of the biggest point sources for carbon dioxide in the whole US, particularly in the West. And the decision now that's recently been made to close down the Navajo Generating Station, probably at the end of the year, could have quite devastating um, impacts for some workers and for the tribal um, income, the overall tribal income on the Navajo Nation. Coal mining and coal-fired electricity are important sources of higher paid jobs and income for the tribes. And what is sad here is that there are very few plans for a just transition or a Green New Deal or sustainable economic opportunities. One option for reducing emissions in the Southwest, oops, let me keep that there, one of the options that people have talked about is, well, maybe the Navajo Nation could become a leader in solar energy. And, of course, one of the main alternatives to coal running our economy in the American Southwest is solar energy. But solar energy isn't always consistent with sustainable development for the poor. Solar energy is not always accessible for poorer communities. In my town of Tucson, when I talk to uh, some of the neighborhoods, people get really mad when you tell them you should have solar energy on your roof. They tell us the upfront costs are too high. It's still $20,000 to get enough kilowatts up on your roof to run your air conditioning in the summer. 
Most people can't afford those upfront costs. And then some will say, oh, well, you could get a loan. Well, many poor communities don't, earn, um, don't qualify for loans. They don't have a credit rating that allows them to get the loan. And then the most insulting thing is when some better off person says, oh, but the tax breaks are so good for solar energy. Well, if you're not earning enough to pay taxes, you don't benefit from that. And to cap it all, um, Alec and some of the um, think tanks are now trying to undermine solar by charging you a lot to connect to the grid. So it's making solar very, very hard. So the challenges of a just transition to a low carbon world that's equitable and is sustainable are vast both within and beyond the American Southwest. Second example I want to talk about is biofuels. Well, many of us, especially probably all of the speakers here, feel pretty guilty about flying. And one of my you know, selfish dreams is of a low carbon fuel for air transport. So one of the options, and it's very important in the 1.5 report, the only way that, the only scenarios that keep warming under 1.5 are ones that rely extensively on biofuels, especially to create an alternative to oil, a liquid fuel. Biofuels are often, I mean, the most sustainable are made from waste products, but a lot of them are made from growing plants, sugarcane, corn, and others. The IPCC report is estimated that depending on how soon we act, for a chance to limit warming to 1.5, we'd have to put large areas of land into biofuels. That could take land out of food security, so it could undermine our goals of eliminating hunger, and or it will take land out of wildland protection and natural ecosystems, which will undermine the SDGs for protecting land, um, life on land and in water. The other problem is, of course, if you put a lot of area into biofuels, that's going to increase food prices with this ripple effect for poor people who already spend a lot of their income on food. So there's another example of a trade-off between climate action and sustainable development. The third example that's quite controversial in terms of sustainable development, and I did a lot of research on this um, when I was at Oxford, is the question of carbon offsetting. So I think most of you will know how a carbon offset works. If you're going to take a flight, uh, you can pay an extra tax, if you like, and that will usually go through a company that then buys credits from carbon reduction projects in another part of the world. So this diagram isn't very good because it doesn't mention individuals, but basically a company or a government or an individual who's feeling bad about flying, they want to reduce their emissions, um, and what happens is that either they directly or a middle person will invest in an emission pro project, reduction project in a developing country. It might be a small-scale hydro project, it might be a renewables project, it might be a tree planting project, or it might actually be some big project to switch from a coal-fired power station um, to um, an alternative energy source. And that project then, you calculate estimate the emission reductions that that project achieves, and then you get a certificate that says, okay, you have offset your emissions. And I think when I fly to London, I do offset, even though there are a lot of problems of it. Um, when I fly uh, back and forth across the Atlantic, it's usually 20 or $30 to um, offset that flight. But the work we did, where we went into communities in Latin America where there were carbon offset projects, showed that they weren't always beneficial for sustainable development. We went into communities where basically people, local people weren't benefiting at all, and offset projects, especially the official clean development mechanism, says that they shouldn't be approved unless there are sustainable benefits for the local community. We found places where um, there was fraud going on. We found places where trees were being planted and then weren't being managed very well. 
But we also found places where offsets were working very well. So in a study we did in Central America, we found that in general, the most beneficial offset projects for the local communities were ones that focused on wind and solar energy. And we even found that those had triple wins, the thing that I'm always looking for. Some of those projects where there was, uh, for example, solar panels in a community, um, women were then able to start um, having little restaurants or uh, keeping food fresher, and it was contributing to um, their um, health and the health of the community. And we also found that when a hurricane came, they took the solar panels down, and then they would be able to, able to get up and running much faster than the communities that were connected to the grid that took weeks to um, reconnect. So carbon offsets... Um, they may not reduce additional emissions. I don't really have time to go into detail on that. And they may not affect sustainable development, but they might under the right conditions. Um, then uh, talking a little bit about, um, the, so I was talking about the trade-offs. And working on those trade-offs for the IPCC, it did make me a little bit depressed. It seemed impossible to eradicate poverty and reduce climate risks at the same time. However, things felt a lot better when we looked at synergies. Um, we found a large literature on synergies, the win-wins, how to increase the efficiency of energy use or replacing fossil fuels. Those have significant benefits for public health. So whether it's more efficient wood stoves that help reduce the burden on women who are um, breathing in um, heavily contaminated air, if it's using renewables to um, reduce air pollution more broadly, there are really strong sustainable development benefits between energy efficiency, renewables, and the health goals. And of course, there are also um, benefits in the move towards more plant-based diets because of they tend to be healthier. And so there again, there's a synergy between a response to climate change where people eat less meat and an, a, a sustainable development goal that says we want people to have better health. Um, so there's a number of other synergies that I've listed here um, where poverty alleviation and improved health, those can reduce vulnerability to natural disasters. Sustainable food systems are often more resilient in the face of climate change. And if you have a sustainable development goal of protecting ecosystems that can actually help you adapt to climate change. And I think the example here is of planting mangroves. Um, so protecting, um, planting mangroves, which is done as a climate strategy uh, to reduce um, the impact of storms on coastal areas and to reduce the impacts of sea level rise, Planting mangroves has been shown in many cases to also provide jobs, that's one of the SDGs, and protect species and ecosystems. So uh, my friend Ashwin Chatri has started an NGO in India which is planting mangroves to protect the coast, but it's also protecting the um, uh, habitat of an endangered species, the fishing cat, in a win-win situation. We did identify a few adaptation options that can work against the SDGs. Mostly, climate adaptation is very good. It helps eliminate poverty, it helps with hunger, it can help protect ecosystems, but not always. Adaptation projects can overlook women. All the money for the project is given to the men. People don't think about women's lives. It can, they can increase gender inequality. Hard infrastructure adaptations, such as this seawall in Indonesia, can redistribute risk to others and may only work for a short period of time. And we also noticed that there's a big trade-off in that the international funds for adaptation are very limited and sometimes compete with mitigation and other development efforts. Wrapping up, I know this is a complicated diagram, but it's a simple idea. The 1.5 report ended with proposals for what are called climate resilient development pathways. These are pathways that could achieve the sustainable development goals 
whilst also lowering greenhouse gas emissions, reducing warming, and promoting climate adaptation. There are some elements of this in the Green New Deal. These sorts of pathways are being explored at the UN this week and in the next IPCC report. I'm the review editor for the chapter that will look at this and I'm really looking forward to more research that will show us how to do this. The pathways should maximize the synergies, minimize the trade-offs and seek equity and well-being for all. And I thought I would give you just one example from what I think of as a climate resilient development project, a, a triple win or quadruple win project in my own backyard in Tucson. Uh, my department is involved with some of the poorest uh, schools in Tucson, um, mostly disadvantaged children. And my colleague Greg Baron Gafford, Baron Gafford has come up with the idea of agrivoltaics. And this is a photo from Manzo Elementary School, which is predominantly Latinx and Native American students, um, most of them on food stamps. And the Manzo Ecology Project is helping us do research that I think can sort of change the world. It's a mitigation, adaptation, and education triple win. So here's what's going on. Solar panels, which you can see above the kids here, they're reducing emissions and reducing costs for the school district. They're also capturing the rain running off the panels for rainwater harvesting. But the really amazing thing is that the team has found out that if you plant agricultural crops under solar panels in the southwest where there's a lot of sun, you get much higher yields because we have very, very hot sun during the summer. So the, the uh, Photovoltaics shade the plants, they reduce evaporation, they save water, and they increase the, the yields of healthy foods that the kids then eat for lunch. The other really amazing thing is that in my part of the country, it actually gets too hot for solar panels to work efficiently if they're just out there on their own. The evaporation from the crops cools the solar panels and increases their efficiency, so it produces more electricity. And if you put these out in the field, or if you think of the kids working out here in their school garden, this is a school garden, it redu they reduce heat stress for workers if you're working under the shaded panels. And then they have this amazing educational value because these kids are now seeing themselves as scientists and contributing to reducing um, the risks of climate change while also doing things that are good for their health and their community. So for me, this is an example of the sort of win-win that I think we should be looking for. And I'm going to end with a slide that a lot of people use in their talks, but it's absolutely what I'm talking about. What if it's a big coax? Well, we know it's not a hoax right now. So we're going to create a better world for nothing. We're actually going to create a better world for something. Thank you very much.